Shalom. We're continuing with the Gospel according to John. We're trying to point out some cultural context for the times and the people of Yeshua who would have participated in these events. Reading from the text, John 6, 1. After these things, Yeshua went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Yeshua went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Yeshua then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come to him, he says unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little bit. Pausing for one moment here, there is some contention about verse 6-4. I am not well studied on that topic, but there is plenty of other evidence to show what time of year it is. It is this verse 6-4 upon which the timing of a three-and-a-half-year or three-year ministry of Yeshua is based. So people say, well, maybe he didn't actually minister for three years if this verse doesn't belong here. Other than that, it doesn't change any of the narrative. Continuing in verse 6, 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Yeshua said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, in number about five thousand. And Yeshua took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten. Now this is not the first feeding of a multitude. There is a similar event in Second Kings concerning the prophet Elisha, Second Kings 4:42 4, through 44 and there came a man from Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God, which is Elisha, bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servant said, What, should I set this before a hundred men? And he said again, Give the people that they may eat. For thus says Jehovah, They shall eat, and shall leave thereof. So we see that it is a season of first fruits. Again, we're talking about barley loaves. So this is in the time period around Passover. We also see that there is grass on the ground. It's springtime. In the other renditions of this event, in Mark 6 and Luke 9, Yeshua directs the disciples to have the people sit in groups, which is very much Passover-like, that each group, each household is going to take a lamb for their household. He gives thanks. Many times we hear people blessing the food that never takes place. There is a specific group of blessings which are said before eating certain food. Now what are the numbers about? Well the two fish actually represent the whole house of Israel. That is the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim. And we're going to see another connection to that in a minute. The five loaves are the five books of Moses, and an important theme of this chapter is that the Torah, that the Word of God, is food. Of course, the twelve baskets left over means that there's enough for all the tribes, all twelve tribes. There's a full complement of food for the people. What you're looking at here is two mosaics. The one on the upper left is in a little church uh, on, on the Sea of Galilee in a town called Tagba, and it is meant to represent the feeding of the 5,000, the two fishes, the basket of loaves, and reportedly this event took place where the church is now. The mosaic on the bottom right is two fishes, and if you can read a little bit of Hebrew, it's the letters are not perfectly formed. It says dagim, which means fishes. And this is also from the region of Tiberias. There was a very popular design theme of synagogue floors in the third century. And those were of the complete 
zodiac circle. So some of them are complete, some of them are incomplete, but there's enough there that you can see. So the fish, the dagim, is Pisces. It corresponds to the month of Adar. The month of Adar is the month of Purim, and the story actually of the two fish is that they represent the two houses, Judah and Ephraim. One is swimming the way of the world, the other is swimming toward God, but their tails are tied to each other, and so they can never escape from each other. All the tribes are eternally tied together. Concerning Purim, we have Mordechai, who is swimming the way of God. He is in the public view. And we have Esther, who is in the king's court. She is swimming the way of the world. But we see that they are eternally tied together, and their fate is tied together. Continuing in verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Yeshua did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Yeshua therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down to the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Farnachum. And it was now dark, and Yeshua was not yet come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty, or thirty furlongs, they see Yeshua walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. But he says unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. So this display of authority over the water is very much connected to God the Father. It's a display that Yeshua is God. We see in Genesis, God's Spirit is hovering over the water, and he brings order out of that. In Exodus, he splits the sea. In Joshua, he splits the river. There's a scripture in Job 9.8 which alone spreads out the heavens and treads upon the waves of the sea. We also see this amazing moment where Yeshua gets in the boat and bam, the boat's at the land. We might call this an example of teleportation. And we know from the book of Acts that Philip experienced such a thing where he's in the carriage with the eunuch and then bam, he's gone. This kind of event is described in, in the Talmud on a commentary of uh, Genesis 24, where the servant is going to find a bride for Isaac. The commentary says the land miraculously contracted for him, and he arrived quickly. The word there, which is translated here, contracted, is the word kvitsa, which means a jump. The land jumped underneath him. Rashi also comments on this. He says, Hence we may infer that the road shrunk, that it jumped for him. In other words, that the journey was shortened by a miraculous manner. And a similar event is documented in a commentary on the book of Esther, talking about Trajan, who was a Roman emperor in the first century and not much beloved. But at some point he was making a journey, and it said his journey was halved. It was half as long. This is known as kvitzat haderach, the idea of the road jumping underneath. And if you are a science fiction fan and you have read Frank Herbert's Dune, or perhaps you've seen the movie, he has a character named kvitzat haderach, and he is the messianic character, I think, who's named that. But Frank Herbert took the concept from Hebraic writing. Continuing in verse 22. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein to his disciples were entered, and that Yeshua went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, not into the place where they did eat bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Yeshua was not there, neither his disciples. They also took shipping and came to Kfar Nachum, seeking Yeshua. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when did you come hither? Yeshua answered them and said, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life 
which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him has God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Yeshua answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign do you show then, that we may see and believe you? What work do you do? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Yeshua said unto them, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So the people in asking for a sign, they ask for a very specific sign, and for this reason, that Yeshua, or the Messiah, must be like Moses. In the commentary on Ecclesiastes 1.9, the former Redeemer caused manna to descend for them. In like manner shall our latter Redeemer cause manna to come down, as it is written, There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountain. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. That's from Psalm 72:16. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be done, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Therefore, Messiah will do all the works of Moses, and this is why they ask about the manna. Continuing in verse 33. For the bread of God is which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Yeshua said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that you also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Yeshua, the son of Yosef, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I came down from heaven? Yeshua therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has heard of the Father comes unto me. So here he's referring to a verse in Isaiah fifty four thirteen, and all your children shall be taught of Jehovah. Over and over he emphasizes the fact that if you follow the Torah and you keep the Torah, you will come to the conclusion that Yeshua is the Messiah. The commentary on Isaiah 54, the children of Israel, of Jerusalem, and of Zion are very frequently mentioned by the prophets for those Gentiles that were to be converted to the faith, taught before of the devil by his idols and oracles, but they should become the children of the church and be taught of God. And indeed, after Yeshua leaves, we see this huge influx of Gentile into the body if you remember in Acts, after the council meets and they decide on a few things that the new Gentiles come into the faith must practice, there is a verse, Acts 15.21, that says, For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. It was expected that the new Gentile believers would go to synagogue, learn Moses, and be taught Another reference, Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-four, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yehovah, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Continuing in verse 46, Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father, Amen, amen, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. 
The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yeshua said unto them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. So this may seem like a very confusing and contentious statement. First, let us remember that Yeshua was born in Beit Lechem, the house of bread. He is the bread of the world, and he was born in the house of bread. In John 4, we read how he gives the living water. We should remember always Matthew 13:34. All these things Yeshua spoke unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spoke he not unto them. So the elephant in the room is, is he talking about cannibalism, really? Well, I think it's pretty clear that he's not. Everyone he is speaking to is bound by Torah. Torah defines for the people what is food and what is edible. Eating blood is perfectly forbidden entirely. Even going back to Noah, Genesis 9, 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. Reiterated in Leviticus 7, 26, Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it shall be that eats any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. In fact, you're not even allowed to touch a dead body. Numbers 19.11, he that touches the dead body of any man because he has to bury him or take care of him, that soul shall be unclean for seven days. So I don't think that it crossed anybody's mind among the Jewish community that Yeshua was trying to express something literal about his blood and his body. So what is their complaint? What are they murmuring about? They're murmuring about the fact that he has come down from heaven. Remember they said, we know his mother and his father. How can this man say he came down from heaven? They understand that he's making a parable, but they are insulted by the fact that he is claiming to be God, as it was written in John 5.18. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken Shabbat, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So this is the real complaint of the situation. And it's very ironic, taking a side trail of history, there's something which is called the blood libel. It's an anti-Semitic lie which has been accusing the Jews of murdering Christians in order to use their blood, Christian blood, for the performance of religious rituals, particularly for the making of matzah. This accusation was rare in antiquity, but beginning around 1100 in Europe, it was very much promoted by the church, which was at that point still the Catholic Church, and has continued until even recent times, maybe in Russia, but in the Muslim countries it continues to this day. There have been people murdered over this lie. There have been false accusations about when children go missing, oh, the Jews stole him so they could use his blood to make matzah. The whole concept is completely abhorrent to the Jewish faith. We don't eat blood. We don't use blood for anything. The really ironic thing about that is that there is a Catholic doctrine, which is called transubstantiation, which means when they take communion, they believe that the bread and wine they take actually turns into the blood and body of Christ when they take it. So they are the ones that are really promoting sort of this cannibalistic idea. The parable is that Torah, the word of God, is food. Deuteronomy 8.3 And he humbled you and suffered you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Jehovah does man live. We read in Proverbs, this character of wisdom is anthropomorphized, made to speak as a human. Proverbs 9, 5, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Please take the wisdom that I am feeding you and take it into yourself. 
Psalm 19, 9 and 10. The fear of Jehovah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Jehovah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are your words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. In fact, when young children are learning to read their alphabet in Hebrew, some schools use an educational device of drawing the letters out in honey and letting the child scoop the honey up with their finger while they outline the letters so that the word of God will be sweet to them. There's an interesting linguistic parallel here when we read Deuteronomy 6-7, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children the words which God has commanded, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. The word which is translated teach them diligently has nothing to do with teaching. It, the word is shinantam from the root shinan, and I have put the Strong's number there for you, which comes from the word actually for teeth, for sharpening, for chewing, that we should chew on the word of God till it becomes part of us. Further commentary from Talmud, from Proverbs 27, 18. He who guards the fig tree shall eat of its fruit. Why were matters of Torah compared to a fig tree? Just as this fig tree, whenever a person searches it for figs to eat, he finds figs in it. As the figs on a tree do not ripen all at once, so that one can always find a recently ripened fig, so too with matters of Torah. Whenever a person meditates upon them, he finds in them new meaning. Proverbs 3:18. She, the Torah, is a tree of life to them who lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retains her. Also from the Talmud, a commentary. There is mention, even among the Talmudists themselves, of eating the Messiah. Rob says, Israel shall eat the years of Messiah, that is, the plenty and satiety, that shall be in the days of Messiah shall belong to the Israelites. Rab Joseph said, True, indeed, but whom shall eat thereof? Shall Chilek and Bilek, two of the judges in Sodom, eat of it? We must accept against that of Rabbi Hillel, who says, Messiah is not likely to come to Israel, for they have already devoured him in the days of Hezekiah. Continuing in verse 59, chapter 6, These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Kfarnachum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Yeshua knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is a spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Yeshua knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. This concept that the spirit gives life, a word, a spoken word, must come with breath. And the word for breath, and the word for spirit, both in Greek and in Hebrew, are the same word. Ruach in Hebrew, pneuma in Greek. Just as food is useless without consuming it, just as the physical body of man was dead until Jehovah breathed life into it, we have to have that word of life. From verse 66, and how interesting is this? It's John 6, 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Yeshua unto the twelve, Will you go away also? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that you are that Messiah, the Son of the living God. Yeshua answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he that should betray him, being one of the twelve. There have been several interpretations given to Iscariot. The first and foremost is Ish Kiryot, which means either the man of the town of Kiryot, which we see appears in Joshua 15.25. Kiryot can also be an idea of a walled city. Kir is the word for wall. It has also been interpreted as an Ish Sheker, 
which would mean a man who is lying. He's a false witness. Alternatively, there was a group called the Sakari. They were a group of Jewish rebels who were known for committing acts of terrorism at that time by assassinating people in crowds using long knives hidden under their cloaks. Interestingly, the Greek word there, which is translated as devil, is diabolos, which looks like devil. In Greek, it means specifically a slander or a false accuser. I'm glad to be able to get back to this commentary, which I dropped some years ago. Until next time, tasim etainayim al hashemayim. Keep your eye in the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.